All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, and that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Will you please rise as we sing our first hymn this morning? It's a kid's hymn, but I really like it. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, the black and white, they are perfect in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves all the children of the world. Precious in his sight, Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red, white, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Precious in his sight, Jesus loves the little children of the world. Please bow with me. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, you are the Almighty God, the lamp unto our feet, whereby we tra trace our path, renew our spirits, and draw our hearts unto thee. List, up, list us above self love and the evil of our day unto the broad sunlight of your love, so that we may live like those who have put on Christ and have been pleasing in your sight. You have done so much for us. Where would we be without you to guide and direct our comings and goings? It is by faith we gather here today, and it is by faith we come to praise your name. Give us the courage to continue in our faith, Help direct our efforts and our energies so that they are pleasing to you. Please fill us this morning with and this place and all of those who are watching with your holy presence. We are the people of your pasture. Accept our music and our song, our praise and our worship. Make this truly be the place where love grows. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. If you want to turn with me, you may be seated, and you want to turn with me in uh, your hymnals to page 107, Jesus Saves. We have heard a joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, little news to every land, climb the steps and cross the way, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. the road. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing ye islands of the sea, echo back the ocean caves, the shade Jesus saves, Jesus saves. The battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, by his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy quits, sing in triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. A mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, 
Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest thrills and deepest praise. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Our responsive heating. Reading this morning is from Psalms 55, 9 and 10. Confuse them, Lord, and frustrate their plans. Its walls are portrayed day and night against, uh, patrol day and night against invaders. Second Timothy 4, three is our memory verse. The time will come when people will not listen to accurate teachings. Instead, they will follow their own desires and surround themselves with teachers who tell them that they what they want to hear. Second Timothy 4.3. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, skip uh, a couple of songs. Come moving along here a little bit quicker because I got a long sermon this morning, and and uh, I know you don't want to stay till two o'clock to hear it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to move us along. But it's good morning to all of you. And good morning to all of you watching uh, uh, there. Good evening to all of you watching from home this evening uh, uh, on uh, Armstrong uh, Network and. Uh, uh, I I got a report this morning from the the radio station. Uh, people, somebody who listened to the radio told me that that it was a message worth listening to. I guess right that make you think. So and that's what I want to do. So again, if you if you're not uh, picking up, I I haven't talked to Mary yet. She said that when as soon as she could get out of the house, uh, uh, that she was going to get a radio so that she could uh, turn on to uh, uh, the Armstrong. Uh, 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 um, I mean, uh, the uh, Allegheny uh, News Talk Sports Network. And uh, uh, so, and we were just, and again, we want to thank everybody, all of you for watching us. We know we have uh, uh, people from Oil City to, to uh, um, uh, Conneaut Lake uh, and, and places in the middle. If you hear us in other places or even from those places, if you need prayer, if you want counseling, if you need something, please give Give me a call out here. Uh, winter's, uh, uh, well, fall's in the process, and and uh, they still have some warm days, but I'm kind of glad to have the, the super warm days behind us. And and uh, my tomatoes have, have finished, our, a lot of our, our fruits and that. We're picking apples right now on one of our apple trees, and so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a good fall season. Uh, a lot of stuff coming up. We're trying to get our youth group going. We got a couple of kids that, that uh, high school kids maybe, and they were, we're thinking about uh, actually rearranging my route here to church and picking up some and having a youth group on Sunday after church uh, seems to be the, the thing that will work out the best for, for all of us. So I would like your prayers uh, with respect to that. And if you know some kids, if you're in the area or you know some kids that that uh, young people, uh, uh, they want uh, to be part of a, a church youth group, please let, uh, please let me know at that number, 814-967-3628. That's 814-967-3628. Write me at P.O. Box 41. Anything going on with your life, please let me know. Lots of stuff going on. We've got to pay, I think, this week or next week for the radio program, television program. We still, you know, every month... Uh, there, there's a bill, and and, uh, and and the propane season, we're just kind of waiting on the Lord to see what he's going to do with that, but we're praying that uh, but that comes about as well. Um, I saw a program, it wasn't a program, but I, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, um, because... Uh, we haven't had the pastor's rant for a while, so I'm going to have the pastor's rant, and it's going to move right into God's rant. But anyway, um, I don't know if I don't know if anybody uh, uh, saw it uh, uh, this morning on the news 
uh, I happened to go to my computer and, and find out that um, uh, last night, um, 18 adult men in Arizona were arrested for uh, child smuggling, child uh, pornography, uh, selling children into a sex ring. Um, I told you that's going on. There's so many kids at the at at the border that that that's come across with what's going on. There's so many children that are missing that uh, we believe that has, have have gone into this uh, uh, child tra child trafficking network. Most of whom are are used as uh, in in sexual. Uh, some of these kids were were really 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 young, and and I applaud. Uh, uh, all of those in law enforcement that uh, that were able to at least bring that small group uh, into custody. Um, if you have any prayer requests, please give us a, give me a call. Let let me know. Uh, but at this point, uh, do you have a praise? God working miracles, wonderful things in 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 your life. God doing great and and wonderful things. Yes, Sharon. Sharon got her car back early. Yeah, it's good. All right. Yes, Jean. And you didn't have to pay anything. For it. And you didn't have to pay any. That's even a double blessing, isn't it? It was covered under her warranty, and and that was a struggle to get it in. And and uh, but fortunately, um, you know, she 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 pulled a, a, a probably what I would have done. She took her car there, and then she sat uh, waiting. And then they said, "Well, are you going to wait on the car? It's going to be days." And she says, yeah, I don't have any place or any way to go. So, well, okay, let me get you a rental car <laughs> or a loaner. That's good, which she had and uh, was able to, and, and I guess that's another blessing, was she was able to get back without hitting a deer. Yeah. And so we put those whistles on our cars now, and, and uh, we're having a little bit better luck with them. Thanks to Jean for that and Linda for, uh, for those. Anyway, uh, okay, Jean, you had a praise? Well, happy anniversary, so it Linda. Cost you two bucks. Huh? It cost you two bucks. Polly and my anniversary was last week, right? Yeah, but last week, the seventh of Jan uh, September, we celebrated last week. So you'll have to go and celebrate today, right? Are you planning on a celebration? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Good for you guys. All right. Anyone else this morning have a praise? God working miracles. Yes, Charlie. Pardon? Prayer, a prayer request? Yes. Okay. Your cousin? Okay. Charlie's got a cousin who's 10 years old and she has cancer and um, the family's really going through a difficult time because uh, uh, she's been sent down to Pittsburgh, as I understand, and, and uh, they're uh, not looking, that's not a good, good prognosis. It's not looking for recovery. So... We want to keep uh, Charlie's cousin in prayer. Yes, Polly. Your brother got a job. All right. We've been praying about that. We know God answers prayers every time. I'm, can anybody think of raise their hand or think of a time we've raised a prayer that God hasn't eventually answered? He always answers prayers, Charlie. Anyone else have a prayer request? Yes, Linda. Palm Quist. Okay, he has pneumonia. All right, we'll keep his family. Yes, Sharon. My daughter Alexis. Alexis. Okay. And my friends Bill and Brenda who also are struggling with COVID. Bill and Brenda? Yeah. All right. Anyone else this morning have a prayer request? All right. A few have uh, prayer request at home. Now's the time to put them on the front of your tongue or in the front of your mind. And as we lift them all up together, we come to the come before the throne of grace, all one people. Uh, and you're never you're never alone. Your prayers are always raised with ours as well. We want to and we want to keep uh, 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 Mary and Nora and Miriam uh, uh, and Mary and uh, all all of those ladies in our prayers as well. And my mother. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many, many blessings that you bestow upon us. We thank you for our lives and we home and our church and, and we just thank you for all the many things that you do for us. And, and uh, we thank you that 
that you kept your, keep your hand upon us and keep us all safe. We thank you for Jean and Linda uh, uh, wedding uh, uh, anniversary of 51 years together and we know that that's truly a blessing to you as well. Lord, we ask you to be with this country. We ask you to be with all of our leaders and our and their, their leadership. We ask you to be with the military and watch over them, policemen and firemen and EMT and all of those people that that um, that watch over this country and watch over us and have a difficult time uh, trying to, to, to balance things in their life. And we ask you to be with their families as well as they send them off to do work each and every day uh, and pray that they return home, correct? We ask you to be with Mary and Nora and Miriam and, and Marion and my mother Elizabeth and, and we know that you Keep your hand upon them as well, and especially at, at Mary's uh, going through difficulties with her foot and her leg, and we just ask you to con um, give her the strength and bolster her uh, um, attitude and, 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 and bring joy uh, back into her life. We ask you to be with uh, Charlie's family as they struggle with their 10-year-old uh, uh, little cousin uh, uh, in the hospital for cancer, and we just ask you to be with 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 them and, and her as well. We ask you to be with the Palmquist family as they have uh, both uh, COVID and, and pneumonia and, and uh, Alexis and, and uh, Bill and, and Brenda as well, Lord. Watch over, over these names and these people and all of those who have raised names at home. We ask you to be with all of our unsaved loved ones and all of those in this community around who do not know yet Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We ask you to continue to, to give us the ability uh, to uh, continue to, to bring this program and the radio program uh, to the public. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will use those messages to open ears and, and reach people. Watch over us and guide us as we struggle, uh, really struggle to be the people that we need to be for your name's sake. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. As we get ready for the pastor's rant, you can turn to Isaiah 47, 7 through 15, if you would. Turn that way in your Bible. We're going to get there in a, in a, in a little bit. Uh, but, um, you know, I don't watch much TV these days because we got rid of our cable and and I still get a news channel once in a while, and, and I guess that because of what happened in Afghanistan, I spend a little bit more time than normal uh, there uh, just checking on, on what's going on because I don't want to be really behind the, the, the news th that much. But 
I, ha I guess one of the things that really rankled me is that in flipping channels, I saw Jim Baker. And guess what he was doing? He was selling this elixir uh, called silver on the, on the thing. And then I don't know if they were doing a, 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 a discovery thing on him or, or what. But after him advertising for this elixir that cured COVID and hangnails and every other thing there, you know, uh, um, they flipped over to him and he's all in a black black suit and he said, you know, one of the things that one of the things I had to learn is that everything I preached, everything I preached before I went to jail, none of it was in the Bible. It was all wrong. Did you say amen? <laughs> I mean, yeah. He said, for years I preached things that weren't right. And, and then he's selling this elixir that cures COVID. I mean, I don't think a leopard changes his spots. The one thing that I don't, I would, I, I, don't want as my legacy is to ever have somebody said, but he went through this period of time that he was preaching the Bible and the Holy Spirit must have left him because he wasn't preaching out of the Bible. He wasn't preaching anything that was true. I mean, I have tried very, very hard because I'm, I don't, I'm not one of those people. I, I pray a lot. I go to the Lord a lot, to the Holy Spirit a lot for my messages and I will tell you that again this uh, today is another confirmation but another thing that just broke my heart in going through through this uh, and and just uh, just some things I, I don't know why it was a strange unusual week I had a lot of stuff to prepare and there was times I just needed to take a break and and I would hit the news and I found I hit the news at at the time when they were doing the interview about the drone strike in Afghanistan and it broke my heart and actually made me want to cry. That a response to what we did, I don't know, did anybody see that? You know, newspaper or, or the television a couple of weeks ago, all excited about, about retaliating, you know, for what happened at the Kabul airport, had to turn around because... Uh, uh, our our friend down in uh, uh, Tennessee, uh, Ron Paul, uh, insisted to know the details about uh, 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 the drone strike, and it happened to come out on the the news. That uh, then I just happened to happen to flip it uh, at the right time, uh, where it said that uh, they they droned a, a truck, a white van, with seven children in it. They were carrying water. The, the containers that they mistook for munitions or, or, or uh, explosives or whatever were water they were bringing. Ten people died. One of them was an aid worker. Seven of them were children. I think that's why I played the song this morning. Jesus loves the little children. Because Jesus loves the little children whether they're in Afghanistan or whether they're in Africa, or whether they're in Russia, or whether they're here, or in China, or Japan, or any place else in the world. And the one thing that little children should have absolute immunity from is being droned while sitting in a van. I, I, I'm going to touch a bunch of stuff, and I wanna, I'm going to bring that back together. So I want you to hold these things in mind because these are things that are coming up. I'm preparing this sermon, you know, and I've said this before, you know, that 200 years before God raised up Babylon, he knew the name of Cyrus. 
And he told Isaiah to write about what was going to happen in Babylon at the end of the Babylonian captivity and that he raised up Cyrus as we read. And I got to thinking, you know, too, I, you know, I, I, I want to be an equal opportunity person because I, I'm, I am trying very hard not to be political the, uh, the last couple of years because I believe that, that there's a lot, of, a lot of places where we can see that God raised up good men here in this country. I think that God raised up JFK to handle the, uh, uh, the Russian missile, the Soviet missile crisis. I'm not sure that I know of anybody that could have handled it or done a better job for, the, for this country than he did. Certainly, it seems to me that God raised up, and that would be one of the names that God would have, have put on his list that I raised this person up. I think that God raised Trump and put Trump in the sand, just like he did Cyrus. Not that... Trump or JFK was was anything uh, uh, greater than Cyrus was, but certainly there was things that happened uh, under the uh, Trump administration, like Israel being returned or Jerusalem being returned back as the capital. Exactly seventy years of, uh, from that, the beginning of the Abrahamic uh, uh, peace accords, there w there was certain thing. And then I think like Cyrus, the time because we don't hear a lot about Cyrus after God used him for that thing, and then moved him on. We, watching this thing about the kids and about going on and all of these things coming to my mind, I, 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 I had to think about Lincoln because, the, as, as you know, everybody knows, I think, I hope, that I really am a, a history buff. I really, really like to study history. Uh, I think that it helps me understand the Bible and my concepts and things that go together with the Bible. And I got to thinking after... after you know, and watching this thing about droning the kids, about the, the lame, simple uh, 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 things that have gone on with some of, the, some of the leadership in the country. And it made me think about, go back and think about things that I've read about Lincoln. But did you, did you know, I'm sure everybody knows, that, that Lincoln had, when Lincoln came to office and, and he wanted to end slavery, he, he had idiots for generals. He couldn't win a battle in the beginning until he got rid of all of his idiots. But he still went into war. And he had to ask God to send him some godly men who eventually came to, to his, them. But I'm wondering, if, I'm wondering if we would be in the same place as Abraham Lincoln was now, now if we had to go into war. Because I, I see people you know, with, with stars on their, bar, uh, on their shoulders are just passing the buck. But I think that God raised up people like Patton and Churchill you know, to deal with World War II. As I said, God told about the collapse of Babylon 200 years before it collapsed. By the way, if you do the numbers on that, it comes out to 2,751 years ago. And divide that by seven, and you're going to come up with a very interesting number. The president was out in California this week, and he was touting the fact that, that the United States has lost in flames, in fire from the West, a country, that, a state the size of New Jersey has burned up out there. And it's still on fire. We have hurricanes, flash floods, droughts, rampant crime in the streets. Um, political unrest like this country has never seen before. Runaway inflation just on the horizon. Can you believe that in such a time the government, government's geniuses believe that passing a $3.5 trillion spending bill is the answer to our problems? When the real experts say that it's going to be $8.5 trillion at a minimum and they can't raise that kind of money, and I didn't know till I did the research on that. Do you know how much money our government spent just this year so far? $6.1 trillion. It's the most the country has ever spent. And we're going to pile on another $8.5 trillion in debt. China is salivating like Pavlov's dogs, just waiting for the moment they can bankrupt the United States by recalling the national debt that we 
can't repay now. If China recalled their debt today, we couldn't pay it. Have you started to learn how to speak Chinese yet? The price of gas and food and everything else going up and up and up with really no end in sight or relief in sight. The problem on the border with the illegal immigrants, I don't know if anybody saw that. That's a, that's a tragedy what's going on down, down in Texas. The government tried to keep you from knowing what's going on by coming up with this bogus. Now, I was in aviation, so I know it's a bogus no-fly zone. I pointed directly at Fox News' drone so that they couldn't fly their drone over and report the news. But thankfully, the Texas Rangers once again got their men. Well, okay, that's the Mounties. But Texas still sent the Texas Rangers there to defy the U.S. government as no-fly zone. Uh, with one of its Texas Rangers public uh, 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 helicopters uh, uh, and uh, flew over to show that uh, this, this mass, it's not good for even those people there. It's not good for anybody, that situation, to have this sea of, what is it, 15,000 people plus down there now um, uh, uh, in this little compound and growing and growing and peop- and, uh, and, and the people that's down there uh, trying to leave, and none of them are immune. Uh, none of them have been vaccinated. I mean, we, we're speaking about vaccination, vaccination, and 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 getting a booster shot. And did you believe that California would r- really put Gavin Newsom back on in his office? But I did. I knew they would because the world is going in that direction. I keep saying it. it it was silly to, to, to recall Gavin Newsom because certainly if the world is doing what I'm saying that it's doing, that is going to happen. What happened is going to happen just as it did. And again, last night I told you about the 18 men arrested. And then we have all this science and magic around the COVID booster and COVID shots and vaccines and and people who don't know a thing about immunology and, and, and the human, human response and, and, and B cells and T cells and, and spike proteins and how any of that works, trying to tell everybody how to, how, how to do it. But I just happened by, by this, a matter of coincidence, turn on the news just as, as uh, the news was saying, 16 of the 18 medical doctors on the uh, um, uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, voted against booster shots. Said there's no science to it. And people can say I, I had to listen because the doctors were the doctors were were talking one right after another. There's no science to it. We don't know what will happen. Gene came into church this morning after listening to the radio service. He says, you know, he was talking to a friend of his at another church and tell, was telling him that, that me, this pastor, saying that all the prophecies have been filled. The Lord could come at any moment. And the response from this other person is, oh, no. As, like, we're safe, you know. Oh, no. Uh, it has uh, Because the new Babylon has to come first. Well, You know, like I told Gene, and like I put on a radio program, even the Nazis in Germany believed they wore the right hats when they were doing it. And that's where we are. And that's that has to deal with God's rant. That was the pastor's rant. But God rants in Isaiah 47, 7 through 15. And he says, You said, I will reign forever. He's talking to the queen of the 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 whore of Babylon or the second Babylon. He said, he said, God says to the, you said, I will reign forever as queen of the world. You did not reflect on your actions or think about their consequences. Now then, hear this: you pleasure loving kingdom, living in the lap of luxury feeling at ease while dwelling safely and securely. You say, I am the only one. I'm the queen and there is none other. I will never be a widow or lose my children. No one can compare to me. Well, both these things will come upon you in a moment 
widowhood and the loss of your children. Yes, these calamities will come upon you despite all your witchcraft and magic. My question, what do you call pretend science that is not really science? Isn't it, is it magic? I don't know. Verse 10, you feel secure in your wickedness. No one sees me, you said, but your wisdom and knowledge have led you astray. And you said, I am the only one and there is no, no other that is as important as I. So disaster will overtake you and you won't be able to charm it away or make it disappear with all your magic. Calamity will fall upon you and you won't be able to buy your way out. A catastrophe will strike you suddenly, one for which you are not prepared. Now, use your magical charms. Use the spells you have worked at, at all these years. Maybe they will do you some good. Maybe they can make, some, make someone afraid of you. All the advice you receive from your great wise men and magicians has made you tired. Where are all your astrologers and, and stargazers who make predictions each month? Let them stand up and save you from what the future holds. But they are like straw burning in the fire. They can't save themselves from the flame, let alone save the nation. You will get no help from them at all. Their hearth is no place to sit for warmth. Their mind is no place to acquire instruction. This is how they have become to you, those astrologers and, and sorcerers with whom you have labored. For those, your friends, who have been with you ever since your youth, your childhood, when you were young, they will go their own way and there will be no one to save you. My title this morning is The Battle of the Capes. Have you heard anything about what was supposed to happen yesterday and Friday uh, here in this country? There was supposed to be a huge celebration plan all the way up and down from Washington to Boston, uh, from the Chesapeake Bay, all the way up. It was supposed to be this huge celebration. It is my opinion that this is why God had me hold off on this chapter until this week, because you won't know what I'm talking about until, until a little bit later. For certainly I didn't know what was going to happen this week, three weeks ago, but God did. He told Isaiah 200 years before the rise of Babylon, about its collapse, and God even calls out the name of the king he will use to release the Israelites after their punishment has been completed. God told Isaiah about the rise and fall of the second Babylon, which God calls the whore of Babylon, 2,751 years ago. And if you divide that by seven, you get God's other magic number of 400. God knew and gave instruction to Isaiah to write these things and they all happened and are happening and will happen just as God said they would. We shouldn't question that, but we do. This is one of God's claims. He says the dumb idols can't tell you anything. They can't save you. But he, God, the real God, has told us what would happen in advance so that we would know. And those things have come to pass exactly as God said they would. So go figure that one out. Let me read to you a bit of history that all our news media, I think, was supposed to be bringing up this week, but they're going to completely ignore now. Did you know George Washington said, no land force can act device, uh, d decisively unless it is accompanied by maritime superiority. The Battle of Chesapeake Bay was one of the decisive battles of the world. Before it, the creation of the United States of America was a figment, a, a, an imagination. But after it, it was certain, said one of the British naval experts. Few naval battles have, have decided more, Professor Randolph Adams says, a European historian. It deserves the name of British Naval Waterloo. Of Cape Henry, he said. On September 5th, 
1781, off the coast. Listen, Charlie, I'm going to read to you some history. You should know. On September 5th, 1781, off the coast of Virginia, near the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, one of the most critical naval battles in United States history took place. The Battle of the Capes only lasted two and a half hours and did not involve any Americans. But this battle was one of the decisive factors that assured the United States would win independence from Great Britain. French Admiral Francois uh, Joseph Paul Marquez de Grasse Tilly arrived in the West Indies with the French fleet in April 1781. He sent word to French General Comte de Richelambeau uh, in uh, uh, Newport, uh, Rhode Island, that he was under orders to sail his fleet north to assist the French and American armies. General George Washington hoped to use de Grasse's fleet and Richambeau's army to assist the uh, American army in an attack on the British at New York City. Richambeau the, uh, and Washington sent word to de Grasse that his fleet was desperately needed and that any troops and money that de Grasse could bring uh, with the fleet would also be of great help. They suggested that de Grasse come to either New York uh, which Washington favored, or to the Chesapeake to assist General Lafayette. I don't know if you know who General Lafayette, but Lafayette was a pirate uh, in, the, in, the, in the Gulf Coast. But he, he became General Lafayette's American army opposing uh, British General Cornwallis and his army that was reluctantly moved into Virginia. Of course, of ac a course of action favored by Richambeau. Degrassi decided to bring his fleet to the Chesapeake be Bay because of the uh, shorter sailing distance to it, and it was more navigable than the New York Harbor. In Santo Domingo, on the island of Hispanola, uh, the Dominican Republic, de Grassi loaded 3,000 French troops from the Gaetan, uh, Agenois, and uh, Touraine uh, infantry regiments aboard his ship. He also raised 1.2 million livres, which was 6 million U.S. dollars today in Havana, Cuba, from the local government bank citizens to assist the Americans and French armies in America. On August 5th, de Grasse set sail with his fleet of 37 ships, including 28 ships of the line, which are large battleships, seven frigates, and two cutters, headed to the Chesapeake Bay. So we're going to see God really working here. De Grasse took a dangerous route through the uh, Straits of the Bahamas uh, to avoid the British fleet of Admiral George Rodney and Admiral, Sa Admiral Samuel Hood, who were protecting British interest and commerce in the West Indies. When General Washington received news on August 14 that de Grasse was sailing to the Chesapeake Bay instead of New York, he quickly changed his plan. Four days later, he began moving the American and French armies to Yorktown, Virginia, to surround Cornwallis's army that had just two weeks earlier begun settling up a British naval base there. But the success of Washington's daring plan depended upon de Grasse's fleet controlling the Chesapeake Bay. Once British Admiral Rodney earned, learned the French fleet was sailing north, he sent Admiral Hook with a fleet of 14 ships of the line of large ships to intercept him. Though Admiral Hood left the West Indies several days after the French fleet, he took a direct route to the Chesapeake Bay and passed the French fleet in the night without spotting them. Hood arrived by, by do you think see God working there? Hood arrived by the bay uh, on August 25th. Not seeing any French ships there, he thought the ships moved all the way up to New York. And so he headed to New York City. Four days later, the French fleet arrived in Chesapeake Bay, anchored and began offloading French troops near Jamestown uh, to join the army of General Lafitte at, uh, at Williamsburg, uh, 12 miles from Yorktown. Admiral Hood arrives at New York City on August 28th and informed British uh, Admiral uh, Thomas Graves, commander-in-chief of the North American fleet, that de Grasse's fleet was in American waters, but they're not sure where it was exactly. Admiral Graves also learned 
that another French fleet of eight ships of the line under the command of Admiral Louis Jacques uh, Comte de Barras uh, had left Newport, Rhode Island, sailing south. So they figured they were going to Chesapeake. But two French uh, fleets on the move, the two British admirals combined their fleets and with Gravis in command left New York on August 31 with 19 ships of the line. The British fleet reached the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay around 9 a.m. on September the 5th, 1781, and soon received word from the scouting uh, frigate of a large French fleet in the bay. Graves directed his ships of the line to begin to the slow process of moving into battle formation. Admiral de Grasse, unaware of the British fleet's approach, continued offloading supplies from his ships. Many of his ship's officers were ashore when the British fleet was first spotted. The French believed it was the Barris arriving, but as the British fleet sailed closer, the French realized it was a large British fleet. So Admiral de Grasse uh, chaotically rushed his fleet out of the bay, and Admiral Graves failed to take advantage, attacking the French in such a vulnerable position. This gave de Grasse time to organize his fleet into a line of battle. The British and French, French fleet slowly maneuvered to engage each other. The wind direction and confusing flag signals sent by Admiral Graves prevented the back half of the British battle line from getting close enough to fire on the French ships. At 4.15 in the afternoon, p.m., the action finally began with a deadly volley of cannon fire from the leading ships of both fleets. The battle lasted over two hours. The British fleet suffered ship, six ships damaged, 90 sailors killed, and 246 wounded. The French fared much better with only 209 casualties and only two ships damaged. When the sun set at 6.30 p.m., the two fleets disengaged to evaluate and repair damage. Admiral Graves, is realizing his fleet was heavily damaged, was reluctant to renew the battle. Admiral de Grasse waited to see what Graves would do. The fleet on the ocean, placing each other, drifted south within view of each other for several days without further engagement until the French fleet uh, fleet somehow slipped out to where it was uh, uh, could not be detected, and on September 9th, Degrassi slipped out of the sight of the British and sailed back to the Chesapeake Bay, arriving there the next day. And DeBaris, that fleet that was coming down from the fleet, had already arrived in the bay during the battle, and now the French fleet had 36 ships of the line in Chesapeake Bay. The British fleet turned... Uh, for the uh, Chesapeake Bay, the evening of the 10th, arriving outside the bay on September 13. Graves realized his fleet was in no condition to take on so many French ships. He sailed his fleet to New York, leaving the French in control of the Chesapeake Bay. When Admiral Graves reached New York, he raced to repair the fleet to get troops reinforced to Cornwallis at Yorktown. Contrary winds difficulties in securing replacement parts, uh, and slow repairs delayed the departure of the fleet until October 19th, which was too late to be of any help. That same day, Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown six weeks after this French victory. The success of the French feet, fleet in gaining control of the Chesapeake Bay prevented Cornwallis from receiving reinforcements and help ensure that Washington could use the bay to transport troops and supplies to Yorktown. Without Degrassi's fleet gaining control of the Chesapeake Bay from the British victory by the Americans and French armies at Yorktown would have been impossible. Without the French fleet at the Battle of the Capes, American independence from Great Britain might never have been achieved. And then, I don't know if you know it, but the ground portion of this, do you know the movie? Do you know the here? What was it? Mel Gibson's The Patriot was the other side. France was our very first ally in, in our war of independence. They were the first ally we had. 
God tells Isaiah to write about what will happen to the second great Babylon as it falls. There, this is how it will be for those who have been with you ever since you were young. They will go their own way and there will be no one to save you. Friends, our friends since our youth, our first ally before we were even a nation, recalled its ambassadors Friday because of things this administration did to snub the French. This is a huge thing. And to your friend who says, Babylon hasn't arrived yet, you ask him to explain how God predicted that the country that has all of this stuff, God would say that country's first friend would abandon them and leave them. This, I think, is why God had me stop this three weeks ago. But I want to make the condition that there's no political party will ever save you. Okay, so now let me ask. During the time of, ki of kings of Israel, were there political parties? Does political parties have anything to do with the fall of Israel? There were always groups of people who were for and who opposed the king but there were no Republicans or Democrats there. There were no political parties to turn to for answers, and this is my point today. We keep thinking that one political party is more correct than the other one. And certainly, one political party has all the right answers and can surely save us, right? Do you see or hear of anything getting better these days, moving in the right direction? God turned away from Israel because Israel turned away from God. God has Hosea marry a prostitute. She may have been a beautiful woman, but she was a prostitute. You can't help but find yourself in tears while reading the book of Hosea. You can't help but feel the agony God must have felt as he commanded Hosea to marry Gomer. Gomer has three kids, all by three different lovers. Now, I know you probably haven't read the book of Hosea, but if you do, you will never find political parties such as the Republicans or the Democrats as having any of the correct answers there either. God doesn't say to look to the king or look to the army or look towards the Essenes or the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the Zealots, the political parties of that day for answers. God says there is only one place to look for answers and that's to him. I know I read to you about Sennacherib marching his armies to destroy Judah and Jerusalem. It was going to be total bloodbath because Sennacherib was really angry. Israel and Jerusalem would have been totally destroyed except for one thing which caused God to provide Egypt, Ethiopia, and Seba as a ransom. Sennacherib had to turn south away from Jerusalem to protect himself. Now this happened during the time of Hezekiah. And what I would like to know is what political party did Hezekiah belong to or turn to for assistance? You see, here is where I have to go back again to Hosea and the huge agony and tears of God. God has Isaiah marry a prostitute who continues in her trade. This is not an anti-woman thing in any way. So please don't interpret Hosea as being man versus woman. It's about the agony of God spelled out in some way where humanity might understand it. God could have just as easily told Gomer to marry a man who would never be faithful to her and continually cheat on her. But God told the story from the other direction. God has Hosea write, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one who stood over you by fire and cloud and fed you every day in the desert. I'm the one who cared for you day and night. I'm the one who gave you the promised land. I'm the one who marched in with you and gave you a victory after victory. I'm the one who gave you new wine and corn and grain and bread enough to eat and plenty to fill your bars with. Yet at the very first sign of trouble, you turn to Egypt. You turn to political parties for saving. You turn to trickery and bribery and paying tribute to other kings, but you don't turn to me. And you see, this is right where I believe we are today. 
Israel was a nation God chose to be the people he would bring the Savior of the world through. His chosen. But God gave his son. He gave his son Jesus to die upon a cross so that God's son Jesus would have a people to call his own who would do the thing God's chosen people never would do. Be a people who would by faith choose Jesus Christ. God cries out to Israel, I chose you, but in times of trouble, you choose to turn to others instead of turning to me. And that has been terribly painful to God. Political parties, I don't care which one you want to affiliate with or be a part of, won't save you. Neither will things or luxuries. Political parties never save the Israelites. Political parties never save the first Babylonian. Political parties destroyed Rome and every empire the world has ever known since. God saved Israel from Sennacherib's first invasion because of one thing and one thing alone. And this is the reason we must learn this lesson. And this is the perfect example. God says in Isaiah 36, one, setting, up, setting this up now, it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all of the, all the defended cities of Judah and he destroyed them. In Isaiah 37, 1 and 2, it says, and it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he rent his clothes and covered himself with ash cloth and went into the house of the Lord and he prayed. Israel was saved because Hezekiah turned to the Lord and not to Egypt or Ethiopia or Seba or Cush or Persia or any other party. They didn't turn to their gold or anything else. Israel was saved because Hezekiah turned to God, period. But we are, are going, to, but are we going to do that? No. We are looking for political parties and magicians and stargazers and fake news and bad science to save us. And oh, they are so wonderful, aren't they? They have all the correct answers. Just look at well, all the things that have happened in the last month and the last couple of weeks. Plus, we have thousands of years of experience with turning to magicians and stargazers and fortune tellers and shamans and soothsayers and yogis and political parties and politicians and they have always given us, the world, the right and correct answers, right? We need to turn to God as Hezekiah did. Right here is the answer. The place where we see the perfect example. The place where all is lost and someone comes up with the right answer. Hezekiah went into the house of the Lord and he prayed to God for answers and deliverance. Why are churches so empty today? Can you look at the events of these past few months or even just this past week and really believe that God is running things or at least giving a guidance and advice? Can you really say that God is leading when you drone and kill seven children or when you so deeply insult your oldest ally and only supporter of independence that they have to leave and leave you as, as Scripture says they would? God's not there and any part of it, in any way, shape, or form of it, this is clear-cut signal, something is wrong. What happened in California besides the fires? Look to South Texas, the rise of COVID, the Delta variant, the rise on the price of nearly everything, leaving friends who fought with you behind to get beheaded. Don't get me wrong here. It's not the decisions of any political party that got us and has us or keeps us here. It is clearly and squarely on the backs of people who have not turned to the church, have not turned to Jesus Christ, and will not change their life, turn to Christ or God for answers. They will not find the house of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, nor do they accept Jesus as Lord and King and Savior. Just as this verse so clearly and articulately and artfully says we have turned to our wealth, our luxuries, our military, our magicians and soothsayers and horoscope readers, our shamans, our yogis, and they have made us feel strong and secure. We don't turn to God because we don't need him. And it's just okay. 
if we don't have the right answers anymore, if we desert our friends and they turn their backs on us, if we grown innocent children who were trying to deliver water. I mean, who needs France anyway, anyway anymore anyway, for that, that matter? We're, we're the queen of the nations and we don't need anyone. They can pack all their ambassadors up and recall them. And now it'll be our turn to holler, let them eat cake. Do you see anything coming together or getting better? We need to find the house of the Lord and find our knees in the house of the Lord and bring our hearts and tears to God and surrender just as Hezekiah did to save. He looked to every resource and he said, the only thing that I can do is go to the house of the Lord and pray. There is no problem we are now able to tackle correctly handle anymore because you can't find God or the Lord in any way in any of it. We need to surrender to the one with all the correct answers. We need to surrender to the only one who can fix it. We need to surrender to God and our Lord Jesus Christ.